my name is Per Eivind Deli. I work as a geophysicist for Lundin, Norway, and I'm going to uh, have a lecture on a novel source over cable solution to address the Barents Sea imag imaging challenges. The overview of my presentation today is going to cover the background of the problems that we faced in the Barents Sea and how we work to seek a solution to this. Then I'm going to tell you about the acquisition, what we did there, and how we work to come up with solutions on the receivers, the cable safe, the sources we used, and all the technical parameters. And I'm going to cover a little bit on the processing intervals um, and the imaging and then finally I will wrap up with some of the future aspects of this technology. So let's start off with some of the background problems in the Barents Sea. Um, in the Loppa High area which is a core uh, area for Lundin Norway we discovered oil in 2013 and 2014 and we realized that in order to be able to develop this area we needed better seismic imaging. There are multiple plays here and this burn in the tertiary to carboniferous, but they're all in carbonate areas in, on these platform uh, highs. Um, in the Gotta discovery in 2013 and Alta in 2014, you see here the carbonates and how they um, show sinkholes and karstification. And what we are trying to achieve is to be able to uh, drill uh, the wells in the best optimum locations so that we get the best permeability and porosity. And so in order to do that, we really need high definition seismic uh, sections with very, very high spatial resolution. Uh, the bar and C and this particular area is, uh, has a heavy, a large uplift. And uh, you see in this image that uh, the, this means that uh, the velocities are very, very fast in the shallow part of the section. Uh, this means that it's difficult to penetrate um, uh, signal energy and it will um, very quickly bounce off to the sides when you get a little bit larger angles. So, and this is a common problem for the whole of the bar and sea area, this uh, very high tertiary uplift. Here you see some seismic sections covering various areas uh, where uh, oil and gas has been discovered and uh, are prospects. And this, the similar problems are seen several places in the bar and sea here, not just across the Loppa area. Uh, we also have a particularly hard seafloor in this area. It's full of scrape marks from icebergs, uh, and this sets up a very, very uh, large and difficult imaging problems in terms of all the multiple scatterings we have here. So uh, we started by looking into legacy seismic data and reprocessing this. And as you can see in this image comparison, 1998 conventional legacy data has been reprocessed with both source and receiver deghosting. And we are able to obtain a broader bandwidth, especially on the low and also on the high frequencies. But we are still struggling with obtaining better spatial sampling. Here is another example of 1998 seismic from a little bit further up on the Loppa uh, area where you see the uh, Permian reflector, the strong black in the middle there, and the carbonates are underlying this erosional unconformity. And as you see there, there is not particularly good imaging in, in those uh, carbonate areas. Here is a reprocessing of a very old 2.5D, it's kind of a 3D site survey, only 25 square kilometers of data, but you are able to compare these two images and see that there is a very, very large uplift in high density broadband reprocessing of even older legacy data sets. The parameters for this specific uh, uh, 3D site survey data uh, are a very small, a tiny source, only 160 cubic inch, 
and uh, you see that the bins are very small here, so we get high spatial resolution, but there's only a very short offset here, only 800 meters, so the data as such is probably not useful in an exploration sense, but we learn that in order to get very high spatial resolution, you probably need smaller sources and you need to fire them a lot more often. What you're seeing here are interpretations of the top Permian uh, unconformity and the top one is from the legacy data and the bottom one is from the new reprocessing of the site survey data where you see a dramatic improvement in spatial details and pockmarks and sinkholes etc that we are after. You also see that we are able to get very high frequencies in the data quite deep down when we have small sources and a lot of shot points. Here you see gathers from a modern uh, 3D acquisition that has been done quite recently. And I will pinpoint some uh, issues that we see with these uh, data uh, sets. These are migrated PSTM gathers. Um, and I've highlighted some areas here. Uh, one of them is that it's very challenging to remove the multiples here because the data is not uh, shot with dense enough shot interval. So you have a lack of uh, spatial sampling in the CMP domain. In addition, you see that in the shallow part, the near offsets are lacking. And you also see in that large rectangle there that um, a lot of the sensors are actually not recording any useful information. So we are towing very, very long cables in this setting that really aren't bringing any value to the uh, stacking image that you're using in the end. Here I have zoomed in the same gathers for only 800 meters offsets and I will compare these gathers to the site survey gathers now. And notice these are the site survey gathers. They're not the exact match from the same line area, but they illustrate the point that you need to acquire the data differently and with higher spatial sampling in order to get better uh, pre-stack gathers that will generate your final image. So we have learned from this exercise that we need to shoot the sources more often we need to increase the sampling in the crossline by using more and denser streamer acquisitions. And we also need to honor the shorter offsets by having the sources closer to the receivers. And we have tried and looked at these exercises on several data sets in this area. And we see the same issues over and over again. So based on all these learnings, we decided to pursue a different type of marine acquisition setup where we place the sources in the middle of all the streamers. So instead of having the sources in front of and the streamers behind, we are now moving the sources on top of all the streamers. This way we capture split spread marine uh, gathers for the first time ever. And we are also getting full azimuth data on the nearest offsets. And you see the excellent near offset CMP coverage we get by doing this. And we also get very, very small crossline bin sizes. We used this setup in a large acquisition project in the Barnes Sea in 2017. I'm now going to cover a little bit on what we did with the sources. So the source, uh, the seismic source, is where all the signal that is recorded is generated. So it's important consideration to look at your source and what, uh, uh, what is the aspect of the outgoing pulse energy. So we had tested before that uh, with using smaller, more compact source uh, points with less volumes, less guns, and occupying smaller aerial distances. And we realized that we wanted to pursue this also in the bar and sea setting. 
So uh, we had modeled very, very large uh, aerial sources up to 100 by 100 meters all the way down to a point source of only one meters. And we realized that we wanted to get to something like maybe 25 square meters, maybe a five by five meter source was an ideal source to, to acquire data with in order to get very high spatial sampling in your data. So we uh, modified the source, we used fewer guns, we used less than half the source volume, uh, but we managed to get a very nice point source and we also managed to use three sources with very, very wide separation here to um, increase the efficiency of the acquisition at the same time as using more sources. So here I'm showing a conventional shot gather where the sources are in front and the cables are behind. And the offset is normally 200 meters uh, distance between the source to the, the front of the cables. Uh, you can see here highlighted in the red triangles that there more than half of the uh, energy that you want to stack in is actually missing in a conventional uh, setup. And as I mentioned, this higher velocity um, regime that we are in in the bar and sea, the higher these velocities are, these narrower these cones and the more important the near offset coverage becomes. So you see we are missing a lot of energy by having the sources in front of the cables and with the top size setup we are managing to get for the first time in marine toad streamer actually split spread gathers with zero offsets and negative offsets and also positive offsets. And this is really very unique and one of the main features of this source over cable setup. Now the cone is completely full of signal and we are getting much, much higher fold in the data compared to what we used to do. Um, we decided to shoot the data uh, as often as possible and actually this what you're seeing now is how the data was recorded and in order to be able to image the data deeper down you need to de-blend the, the sources from each other. So here are uh, quite a few shot records before the de-blending and these are after. So you're seeing that we get a quite nice result by de-blending of the data. And here, if I do the opposite, I remove the, the middle sources instead. So in the de-blending, we remove the uh, source minus one, we keep the source and we remove source plus one and we go through the whole sequence like that. So we separate all the sources into a single shot with five, six second record length. Here you see a stack before the de-blending where you see all the blended shots in the middle there. And here you see after the de-blending. These are unmigrated and they will of course be much better again when you do this in, with 3D migration. Here you see an actual photograph of the source vessel with its three sources. And if you look up in the front, you see the streamer vessel and it has all the uh, 10 or 12 cables uh, underneath the source vessel in the middle and underneath all the sources. Uh, the sources were towed as a triple source with uh, approximately 135 meter separation and we are roughly halfway down the cable so we have about three and a half kilometer offsets on both the positive and the negative side. This is an image taken by a drone from the streamer vessel towing the 12 cables and you see in the distance the source vessel that is trailing the streamer vessel. We had 14 cables, they were 7 km long and you see in the yellow circle there that is the source vessel uh, approximately 3.5 km behind. Now I will talk a little bit about the processing and imaging of this rather unique data set. So um, the, the processing is uh, for many purposes very similar, but there are a few key steps that I will cover in a little bit more detail, amongst them uh, the D-multiple. 
So I mentioned that the seafloor is very, very rugose and really hard in the Barents Sea. And here is actually an auto tracking of uh, a 10 by 10 uh, kilometer data in the Barents Sea where you see all these uh, scour marks from the icebergs. And that sets up a massive amount of multiples uh, from these diffraction points. Um, the demultiple sequence is uh, now quite complex and we are generating several multiple models and then we are simultaneously uh, subtracting these. Basically we generate a primary model with uh, several uh, demultiple processes and then we use that model to convolve with all the different um, demultiple models to create a final uh, multiple model that we subtract from the input data. Here you see some examples, uh, the input data uh, on the left, followed by various uh, SRME um, data, deconvolved data, diffraction, demultiple, SRMM, and also the primary model is shown in this, uh, this picture. Here are the same data, but now they are shot gathers. So you see the input data and you see the various multiple models and also the primary model that is quite similar to the input data but it has no multiples in it of course. Uh, here is a migrated uh, example uh, showing before and after the demultiple and because the sampling is now very high we are able to remove these multiples without struggling so much and leaving so much noise as we are used to in the bar and sea. Now I'm going to show you some comparisons of the final data. So this is legacy data that we had that was reprocessed and we used this for the interpretation in 2014 and this here is the new top size data. So if you look in the shallow first there is a remarkable uplift in quality of the spatial sampling and you also are now able to really really see the hard layers away from the soft layers. You can basically almost see the seismic stratigraphy out from the, the final migrated data. If we now invert the, this data again in a post stack fashion, we get even better results. Uh, here is a side by side comparison between our legacy data and the new split spread uh, data that we uh, acquired in 2017. And it is really a, an astonishing uplift that we have been able to achieve by moving the sources over the cables and shooting them a lot more often and using a smaller, more point source focused energy output. Here are also some data examples across the target zone where we have the legacy data, the new top size data in the middle and also the inverted uh, 3D data on the right hand side. Here is a time slice example. This is a little bit shallower, uh, approximately 700 millisecond deep, where again you see the legacy data on the, the left and the two to the right are uh, our new data set that we are, have uh, received now. And it's a remarkable uplift in the clarity the low frequency content and also the signal to noise ratio as well as the spatial sampling is dramatically improved. These are some more uh, time slices. They are both shallow and they are deeper. The three at the bottom are showing uh, exactly through the target levels and if you compare the left to the right there is a dramatic improvement basically everywhere. So we are very, very happy with the quality of the new seismic data. And I would say that uh, we have gone through a, a long development, lots of modelings and testing exercises, and we have basically um, optimized and uh, altered a lot of different things. Uh, we used triple source, we put them out wide, we used compact smaller sources, we used dithering to allow us to de-blend the data. The near offsets are now recorded very deep because the source vessel is above the streamer cable so they naturally have to be towed quite deep which means that the near offsets have very very little noise and very very high signal to noise ratio. And of course we managed to get very very um, 
uh, small bin sizes here because of the dense streamer separation and also the triple sources we used. So what do we see in the future for this technology? Well, this is the setup we used, uh, 14 cables, streamer vessel and three sources. We have now also uh, acquired data with six sources, uh, which is an improvement yet again. And maybe we will go to 10 sources, but I do believe that in the future we may see a solution where we try to, meet, uh, try to not use two vessels, but maybe use autonomous source vessel and maybe some longer um, gun umbilicals so that we can have six sources in a topside mode and maybe we also shoot the source behind the streamer vessel to get uh, uh, data for FWI and really long offsets as well. With that I'd like to say thank you for listening and I'd also like to acknowledge my co-authors Jan Erik, Vidar, Andreas, Espen, Tron, Halvor and also a lot of people in CGG, uh, Vetle, Erik, uh, Finn, Kalinge, Anne, Risto and a lot of other people for making this project such a success to obtain these really really nice results we have seen now. If you like this uh, presentation please visit the EAGE YouTube channel for more e-lectures.